Hello, I'm Ross Broadstock from Britain's Hidden History, and I come from South Wales. My grandfather was a coal miner, and his father before him, and before him, and back for many generations. And in the South Wales Valleys, coal is very much part of the, the life structure, although all the coal mines have been closed down the last 30 years or so. One thing which never made a lot of sense is how coal is formed. And not many people think about it, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Now, one of the books, uh, well, a series of books, is by uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky, who has a whole new theory on the dating of the planets and how things work and how archaeology and all sorts of sciences are completely misunderstood. And he's done some great work, things like working out about Venus and planets. Amazing. He was good friends with uh, Einstein back in the early 20th century. Uh, between them, they ran a magazine or sort of periodical reviewing all major scientific stuff of their area, sort of early 20th century. So he's a top, top um, arc, um, academic, and he carried on writing right up through to about 1970, I think. So anyway, this is from Earth in Upheaval, and Velikovsky explains how coal is formed, and it's very different to what we taught in school, and very, very interesting. So page 188. Coal is found in layers that are ascribed to various ages, mainly on the basis of fossils found in them. Brown coal is a compacted mass of plant remains. Lignite is made chiefly out of trees only partially converted into coal. Soft or bitumous coal is brittle and of little luster and contains sulphur. Its organic nature can sometimes be seen under a lens and the plants that participated in its formation can be recognised by leaves in the shales on top of the coal bed. Anthracite, or hard coal, is metamorphosed bitumous, bituminous coal. Anthracite is what uh, South Wales coal fields are, are famous for. The plants that went into the formation of ancient beds include chiefly ferns and cycads. Layers of later ages are composed as sassafras, laurel, tulip tree, magnolia, cinnamon, sequoia, poplar, willow, maple, birch, chester, alder, beech, elm, palm, fig tree, cypress, oak, rose, plum, almond, myrtle, acacia, and many other species. And the reference is the New Geology, uh, page 468 by Price. The origin of the coal beds is still far from being satisfactorily explained. One theory would make peat bogs the place where in a slow process measured by tens and hundreds of thousands of years coal was born. It is said that the plants fall, but before they decompose in the air they are covered by the water of the swamps. A layer of sand is deposited over them, forming of the soil for new plants, and thus the process repeats itself. It's more or less what I remember being taught in school. In order that the layer of sand may be deposited, it is necessary that these marshy regions be covered by water in motion. Since almost all regularly marine shells and fossils are found on top of coal beds, the sea must have covered the swamps at one time. Then, for the new plants to grow there, the sea must have retreated. There are places where 60, 18, 100 or more successive beds of coal have formed. This theory would then require that as many times the sea trespassed, when the land slowly subsided and as many times retreated. In other words, this theory assumes that the ground is pulsating and that the sea will return again sometime and cover the coal beds as it did a hundred times in the past. Fossils of marine clams, snails, are abundant in the shales just above each seam of coal. Later, with fluctuating sea level, the salt waters withdrew, and another freshwater marsh came into being, giving rise to another bed of coal above the earlier one. Again we are surprised, this time by the large number of such alterations of coal with marine sediments. These are now recognised as distinct cycles, each cycle representing a common sequence of events. Ohio displays more than 40 such cycles, 
and in Wales, more than a hundred separate seams of coal have been discovered. Marvin Miller has given 400,000 years as the probable time represented by the average Ohio cycle. So on what that makes uh, Wales. And this is uh, reference Chamberlain in the world and men. This scheme demands not only that the sea should have covered the land 100 times, but also that after each retreat of the sea, a fresh water marsh should have appeared on the vacant ground in order to give the trees a place to grow and fall down and decay. And that the process of decay should have been checked before going too far. For otherwise, in quotes, the vegetable matter would have disappeared completely and none would have been left in the form of coal. And then each time, not only was the aerial extent of the marshes remarkable, but the thickness of the coal required a surprising accumulation of vegetable matter. Many kinds of plants and trees went into the formation of coal do not grow in swamps. And when they die, they remain on dry ground and decompose. This fact suffices to render the peat bog theory untenable. Seams of coal are sometimes 50 or more feet thick. No forest could make such a layer of coal. It is estimated that it would take a 12-foot layer of peat deposit to make a layer of coal one foot thick. And 12, peat, sorry, 12 feet of peat deposit would require plants remains 120 feet high. How tall and thick a forest must be then in order to create a seam of coal not one foot thick but 50? The plant remains must be 6,000 feet thick. In some places there must have been 50 to 100 successive huge forests, one replacing the other, since so many seams of coal are formed. But it is further questionable whether the forest grew one on top of the other, because a coal bed, undivided on one side, sometimes splits on the other side into numerous beds, with layers of limestone or other formations between. The consideration of the enormous mass of organic matter needed to form a coal seam brought about the birth of another theory of the origin of coal. Fallen trees were carried along by overflowing rivers, and coal was formed from them, not from the plants in situ. This theory explains the enormous accumulation of dying plants in some localities. It may be able to show why, in many cases, a fossilised tree trunk is embedded in coal, with its lower part uppermost, or standing on its head, which the peat bog theory does not explain. But the drift theory cannot account for the fact that various kinds of marine life are mixed with the coal. Carbonaceous and bituminous shales are frequently packed with fossilised marine fish. Deep sea crinoids and clear water ocean corals often alternate with the coal beds. Erratic boulders too are often encased in coal. It was supposed that these boulders were carried by chance on natural rafts of closely drifting logs and thus became embedded in the coal. Close rafts of drifting trunks are conceivable only after a great hurricane. However, marine fish would not enter deeply into inundated rivers to be entombed together with the boulders. And coral does not grow in muddy water. <clears throat> Apparently, the coal was not formed in the ways described. Forests burned, a hurricane uprooted them, and a tidal wave or succession of tidal waves coming from the sea fell upon the charred and splintered trees and swept them into great heaps, tossed by billows, and covered them with marine sand, pebbles and shells and weeds and fishes. Another de tide deposited on top of the sand more carbonised logs, threw them in heaps, and again covered them with marine sediment. The heated ground metamorphosed but the charred wood into coal, and if the wood or the ground where it was buried was drenched in a bituminous outpouring, bituminous coal was formed. Wet leaves sometimes survived the forest fires and swept into the same heaps of logs and sand, left their design on the coal. Thus it is, thus it is that seams of coal are covered with marine sediment.
For that purpose also, a seam may bifurcate and have marine deposits between its branches. A support of this, my view on the origin of coal, I find in a recently published extensive work by Herbert Nilsson, Professor Emeritus of Botany at Lund University. And the paper referred to is Synthetische Art, um, Artbildung. That's 1953, chapters 7 and 8. This, this book was written in the 50s, by the way. And it was a massive multi-million seller. Nielsen presents the result of an inquiry into the botanical and zoological composition of the brown coal lignite of Geiserstadt in Germany, made by Johannes Weigelt of Halle and his group. Many plants found in Geigerstadt lignite are tropical. There's tropical plants in Germany. Of species that do not grow even in the subtropics. A long list of tropical families, genera and species disturbed in Geisestel coal was made known by E. Hoffman and W. Bine. Algae and fungi on the leaves preserved in the coal are found today on plants in Java, Brazil and the Cameroons, <coughs> researched by Kirk. Besides the dominating tropical flora in Geisestel, plants are represented there from almost every part of the globe. The associated insect fauna of Geisestel coal is found in present Africa, in East Asia and in America, in various regions, preserved in almost original purity. Researched by Walter, <coughs> Walter and Weigelt. The coal of Geisestel is rated as be belonging to the beginning of the tertiary time. As the reptilian, avian and mammalian fauna, the coal is a veritable graveyard. Apes, crocodiles and marsupials, that's pouch animals, left their remains in this coal. An Indo-Australian bird, an American condor, tropical giant snakes, East Asian salamanders left their remains there too. Some of the animals are of steppe habitat and others like crocodiles come, came from swamps. Not only do the origin and the habitats of plants and animals offer a very paradoxical picture, but so also does their state of preservation. Chlorophyll is preserved in the leaves found in the brown coal. The leaves must have been rather quickly excluded from contact with air and light, or rapidly entombed. These were neither leaves falling off the plants in the autumn nor leaves exposed to the action of light and atmosphere after being torn off by a storm. Entire strata of leaves from all parts of the world, counted by the billions, though torn to shreds, but with their green fibres, their nervature, intact. In many cases still green, are found the geyser-style lignite. It is not different with the animals, if exposed after death for any length of time to natural conditions, the structure of animal tissues loses its fineness. The muscles and the epidermis, the skin of the animals of the brown coal of Geisestal, were found to have retained their fine structure. Also, the colours of the insects are preserved in their original splendour. The very process of fossilisation, with silica invading the tissues, must have occurred Fast Blitzschnell, almost instantaneously, in Nielsen's opinion. While the membranes and the colours of the insects are preserved so well, it is difficult to find a complete insect. Mostly only torn parts are found. Nielsen is convinced that the animals and plants found in Gesichtstadt coal were carried there by onrushing water from all parts of the world but mainly from the coasts of the equatorial belt of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Madagascar, Indonesia, Australia, and the west coast of the Americas. One thing is, however, evident. Coal originated in cataclysmic circumstances. And for those of you who might be new to Velikovsky, the main thrust of his arguments is that the world has been subject to a series of major catastrophes 
and that the planets as well are much younger than is given. Things do not take millions and millions of years to develop through what's called gradualism, the mainstream view. Now, this has major repercussions on uh, history and dating as well. I'm going to be a lot more on dating soon, and it's not a way to find a new partner. Very difficult under the current lockdown conditions. Looking at chronology and how items are dated by archaeologists. So more of that soon.